Let me have you open your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew, chapter 22, and I'm going to begin with the first verse. You can follow along as I read. Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, uh, and they would not come. Again he, <clears throat> excuse me, again he sent forth uh, other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, <clears throat> excuse me, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant took his servants and, uh, in, excuse me, uh, and, and entreated, I'm going to have to get a Bible with larger print, <laughs> and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth and... Um, My goodness. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. That's pretty rough, really. Think about it. Then saith he to the servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highway uh, and gathered together all as many as they, as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having on a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then uh, said, he, said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him out into... I'm sorry, I'm ready. And cast him into outer darkness... There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. I'm going to stop right there. I apologize for having trouble with that text today. In this parable, and by the way, it said Christ spoke to them in parables. A parable was a, an object lesson to teach something, and uh, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't say you press every detail all the way, but it's set up to teach a number of object lessons, a number of things that are generally true about something else. So if someone says, well, what about a guy going into the marriage supper uh, unsaved, the guy without the, just don't get so hung up on detail. I want you to learn what the word parable means, and it will be much easier for you in the future. But in this parable, the Lord Jesus paints a picture of God rejecting the nation of Israel because they rejected him. And that was accomplished in 70 AD when the Roman army uh, invaded Jerusalem. He also tells them um, his intention is to fill 
his heaven with people beside Israel, not just them. The king in the parable sends his servants out to find guests to come to the wedding. And uh, they gather together. The, the king notices a man who's not dressed properly uh, at the reception. He was a wedding crasher. And uh, the man is cast out and, um, of the celebration because he was not ready to be part of it. He was not dressed properly. Uh, these verses picture, uh, uh, paint a picture of your spiritual salvation as well. When Israel rejected Jesus as their Messiah, he began to move towards the Gentiles and eventually reject Israel um, because they rejected him. And uh, as you see the book of Acts unfold, the gospel is extended to Gentiles as well as Jews. Jews and Gentiles. God uh, wants his heaven to be filled with guests. He wants it to be filled. And um, the Lord intends to fill heaven with uh, the redeemed from all the world. doesn't matter if they're Jew, Gentile, man, woman, whatever language they may speak, what nation they're from, what ethnicity they may have, uh, God wants them to be saved, and they all have to be saved the same way. But uh, only those who have a personal knowledge of God and a personal relationship to Jesus Christ will ever get in. There's a certain uh, standard everyone has to meet. Um, the Bible tells us that uh, when the redeemed of the Lord gather together in heaven at the marriage supper, uh, it's a time of celebration known as the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb, according to Revelation 19, verses 7, 8, and 9. Uh, the Bible describes, or rather the Bible doesn't say uh, a lot about the marriage doesn't give us a lot of detail about what's going to take place during that period, beginning at the rapture and coming uh, to an end just prior to the visible return of Jesus Christ. But the Bible says, Revelation 19, verse 8, that those participating in it are arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. In those, uh, it's those wedding garments I want to talk about today. Um, if those who are saved by grace um, meet together in heaven uh, and they're, they're dressed in pure white at the marriage of the Lamb, then those garments have to have some great importance, some great significance. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when it comes to the wedding, the Bible tells us that you must be clothed in the proper garments or you're not going to get in. We're going to have a wedding in a few weeks here for Brother Gene Ha and uh, his wife-to-be here. And... Um, uh, I, I hope no one comes just dressed in casual flip-flops and so forth. I hope people actually put some effort. You indicate how important something is by the effort you put in to dressing for it. When my one of my daughters had an eighth grade graduation, it wasn't a big class of students, but there were a lot of guests, family members and uh, uh, in the auditorium. And I noticed I was the only dad wearing a coat and tie. It was surprising to me. Maybe I shouldn't be surprised given the, the kinds of the, uh, people's tastes these days. But it's very disappointing. Um, I asked uh, one of my daughters 
if I could wear flip-flops and just a polo shirt and some shorts on her wedding day. And uh, that was a no. <laughs> the answer was no. Uh, however, there are some people who take even their marriages and their wedding ceremonies that casual. And uh, some go more casual than that. And uh, you wonder, rather it's no wonder, when their union, their wedding, falls apart uh, eventually. They, they weren't serious about it to begin with. And uh, whether it's right or wrong, it's nevertheless true. You indicate something is important to you by the effort you make to put in it, to put into it, get ready for it. So let me ask you today, are you dressed for the wedding? Are you dressed for the wedding? Are you bearing the uh, righteous garments of the Lord Jesus Christ that God would be pleased with? When it comes to the wedding garments, first of all, let me say, it's available to everyone. The wedding garment is available to everyone. In verses 9 and 10, the king sent his servants into the street to find as many as they could find. And he wasn't concerned with their financial status. He wasn't concerned with their education that they may have achieved or not achieved. He wasn't concerned with <clears throat> what their occupation was or what their job was during the week. But uh, he wanted to make sure that they were all covered in the wedding garment that he thought was suitable for his son's occasion. You know, <clears throat> in modern times, especially in the Western world, when we say the West, we're generally talking about West of Israel. When we tell you the East, we're talking about East of Israel. Sometimes it's the Near East, Middle East, Far East. But um, in the West, and, and it may be largely influenced because of um, Roman Catholicism's virgin goddess worship, that they elevate the woman uh, and the female deity above everything else. Uh, and she's wearing the white dress. Uh, however, that has scriptural that has scriptural support because you and I are going to be dressed in fine linen, white and clean when our groom comes to meet us. But in Bible times, it seems as you read the parable, parables Christ gave, that the emphasis was on the son. This was his big day. Everyone was expected to dress in such a way that they would match one another. So no one's calling attention to themselves. All the attention was on the son. He was going to inherit the property, the land, the farms, the servants, and everything the father had provided was going to be his. And so the big celebration was for the son and his possession of his domain or his kingdom. Um, however, you and I are still expecting uh, to be dressed in fine linen, white and clean, so that no one's calling special attention to themselves and all the attention will be on how Jesus Christ is arrayed on that, when that time comes. But the Lord Jesus, or the rather the Father in the parable, wanted his wedding and wedding feast to be furnished with people who were dressed properly. And uh, that's a great picture of your salvation and what the Lord has done for you. He opened the way to be forgiven. He opened the way to be accepted in the beloved and received by himself by uh, sending the Lord Jesus to die for your sake and die on your behalf, be suffer and be punished for your sins. I was thinking as we were singing some songs earlier how much emphasis there used to be, and I don't see it much anymore, not in modern Christian music, how much emphasis there used to be on the death and the bleeding and the dying and the suffering and the pain 
of the Lord Jesus Christ for you and for me. You don't hear that theme running throughout most Christian songs these days. It's a, it's a tragedy. But uh, that's the nature of contemporary church music, if you want to call it that, uh, and the, the thinking of modern church songwriters. You know, small, a few little uh, uh, rhyming lines, and a guy with a guitar leads everybody to sing it, you know, 12, 13 times, and then you're done and move on to another one. And there's no real depth, there's no real substance. Guys write so-called praise choruses uh, about every three or four months, and there's no real, the, the songs are not born from any real experience in the heart of the songwriter. There's something missing in the songs everybody's asked to sing these days. There's no real message, there's no real substance to it. And if you just dwell on it for a while, compare the song uh, lyrics, the words, compare the melody, compare the harmony. Um, I like singing out of the book because when we sing, uh, kids learn how melodies go up, the notes go up, your voice goes up, and they go down, and someone comes along and helps you discern um, harmony parts and bass parts and makes a great harmony. But nowadays it's just, a, you know, words on an overhead and uh, maybe there's a bouncing ball, but usually not much of a bouncing ball. And uh, there are some guitar chords thrown on the screen. But I think people are being cheated by not being taught basic music structure. You don't have to be a mu musician, but if you can figure out when the line, when the notes go up, your voice is supposed to go up, and how to follow that, uh, it'll be a great blessing to you. We read, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that is a thirst, uh, or him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whoso will, let him take of the water of life freely. Revelation 22, 17. God wants people to be saved. And uh, so point number one, I would say it's available to everyone. Let me jump forward a little bit here. Secondly, let me say this. The garment must be accepted by everyone. You look at it, well, that's nice, but if you don't put it on, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do and cover your wickedness, cover your uncleanness, and make you pleasing the eyes of God. Spiritually speaking, the day a person accepts the Lord Jesus Christ and his death for their sake for the sake of their sin, when that moment happens, when that moment takes place, that person goes from sinner to saint that fast, and their wickedness is now covered with that perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, as a matter of fact, if they've trusted in his righteousness and trusted in his perfection as a, and his death for their sins, that stain of wickedness is not even underneath their robe of righteousness. It's removed completely. And God sees you covered in the perfection of Jesus Christ and sees you and uh, your righteousness uh, is no longer a, a factor. Only the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ counts. But I want you to notice four things about the garment. It's uh, received by faith. It's received by faith. Um, I'm going to bring an outline or bring a, a, a few items uh, today in our uh, afternoon time. I'm going to call that uh, show and tell because I got a whole bunch of things people think are necessary for their salvation. And none of them can affect salvation with God. 
It's the, the, it's the age-old belief that there's something I have to do to earn my salvation or to merit my salvation with God. First of all, I want you to notice uh, it's re received by faith. Um, the way to get the wedding garment is by simple faith. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't barter for it. You can't trade anything for it. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Also, it's totally free. Totally free. The best things in life are free, and the best thing about eternal life is it's free. That is, if you're smart enough to take God's offer by the death of Christ, um, you can't purchase it, you can't earn it, you can't deserve it. There's nothing you can do to make yourself uh, uh, justified to have it except trusting Jesus Christ by faith. Let me also say, it's, um, the garment is a proper fit every time. Uh, the, the wedding garment, the purity of Jesus Christ, his virtue, his reputation, his sinlessness is credited to you by trusting that he suffered for your sins. He suffered for your sake. He died on your behalf. He was judged by the Heavenly Father for your sake, for your sins, so that you wouldn't have to be, by, by trusting in Him, by faith alone, you have eternal life waiting for you. And once you're saved, there's nothing you can do to sort of add to it, make sure of it. He makes sure of it. He saves and He separates you from the world and He keeps you saved and He keeps you secure no matter what you do. The Apostle Paul writes, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. If you're, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You say, you ask, well, how do I get in Christ? How do I get in Jesus Christ? That's a very simple question, and there's a very simple answer. The way you get in Jesus Christ is by asking Christ to come in you. Ask Christ to come live in you, and you will automatically be put in Him. You'll be part of His body. Jesus said, At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. John 14, verse 20. So it's a very simple proposition. To get into Jesus Christ is by asking Him to come into you. And then we can sing, Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Amen. Tis done, the great transaction's done. I am the Lord's, and He is mine. He drew me, and I followed on, charmed to confess the voice divine. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, the book of Psalms says. Someone who's ashamed to speak for Jesus Christ. They're embarrassed. They can't muster this, the, the courage to talk to someone um, about simple spiritual things. And um, you know, listen, I'm not saying every Christian has to unload the entire gospel on someone and, and force them to do this, that, and the other, or say a certain prayer, or behave a certain way. Some people don't have the gift of gab. Some people do. Some people have it, and they don't want to use it for Jesus' sake. And uh, others who don't have the gift of talking to people and just starting a conversation, they want to be able to witness. They want to be a better testimony for Christ. And it's uh, unfortunate that uh, it doesn't always work out that way. But as I was saying, uh, the garment is a proper fit for everyone. And it doesn't matter if you're tall, short, fat, skinny, 
uh, doesn't matter what your your skin color was, your ethnicity was, uh, the garment God gives you of righteousness is a proper fit. It's a perfect fit. And you can't improve on it. And also, let me say, the Father approves of the garment. Uh, I want to please God. I want Him to approve of my appearance with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But in the parable, he found a man who wasn't dressed properly and he was upset. And the man had no reply. He had no comeback, no witty reply, response. Uh, some of these agnostics and atheists, they think they're real clever and cute, thinking if I ever do stand before um, a God, I'll know how to answer back for myself. Imagine anybody being as foolish as that. If there's a God who created all of regality and everything in the universe uh, operates by his allowance and his permission, there's nothing that he's not aware of concerning you. And uh, you won't have the chance to come back with some smart aleck reply and uh, complain against God, complain against Jesus Christ. He'll take you back and show you all the times the gospel was presented to you in some way, in some form, and you didn't have enough sense to see it. You didn't have enough sense to embrace it and take it as it was and uh, call upon God. Men don't want to admit that they're sinners. Everyone else is a sinner, but not me. That seems to be the way they operate in life. And uh, if anyone's going to make it, if there is a heaven, uh, surely I'm going to make it. And so they just say, well, there's nothing I need to worry about. It's all taken care of. Yet they've never made a move in God's direction. Point number three today, I want you to consider the ability of the garment. The ability of the garment. First, it changes one's appearance. It changes one's appearance. The bride stands out from everyone else at the ceremony, but all the guests are also clothed with a garment that the Heavenly Father was pleased with. When it changes the appearance, it, it makes you, it, it, it gives you the, the um, presentation uh, that God is looking for. It gives you the appearance, uh, the, the transformation that God wants to see. No matter who you are, who you were when you came in, he wants to see all of you dressed uh, with the perfect righteousness uh, of his son. And it's, and it's, typified, symbolized by Christ's parable. It changes one's appearance. It makes you look in such a way. And uh, I've been teaching or telling some of you that um, the, the big deal with Mormon people is their appearance. Mormons think their religion is better than everyone else because of their appearance. Everyone's a nice white shirt, conservative looking suit and tie, conservative haircut, and um, their uh, women are all dressed very conservatively. And um, this is universal. It's consistent. Everywhere, everywhere you go, every Mormon church you go to, they're all going to be dressed in a certain way because they believe that indicates their genuine faith. And it's a, a picture or a symbol of their religion being true and everyone else is being false. And uh, so that's why whenever I've worked and had to go to a Mormon church service, uh, I try to dress like I'm dressed today. So I look as conservative as they do and throws them off. I've had Mormon bishops try to shake my hand and grip my hand in a certain way 
and I didn't return the grip like a special handshake, and they thought I was one of them. And I like messing around with them because, <laughs> because it shows how flimsy and uh, feeble their religion actually is. Their religion actually is. But they're convinced that, that um, their outward appearance indicates that their faith is more pure, it's more holy, it's more appropriate for God. You go to a Mormon church and someone comes up to say a prayer, and uh, everyone has to be quiet. And Brother Lee sees what I'm doing, and he's doing the same thing. This is how Mormons pray. First of all, it gets real quiet. And then the person, there's a certain body posture. And they hold, fold their arms in. And once it's quiet, then the person starts to pray. And they don't get animated or excited when they pray. But they're very calm and tranquil. And they think this is the right frame, the right posture for the Holy Spirit to come. We at the cemetery, you know, you can hear the trees blowing and cars going down the street. And some guy is going to so supposedly dedicate the grave. So everyone's gathered around. Guy folds his arms. They've got to do this to attract the spirit of God. And um, it, it, it's really, it's childish when you think about it, but they believe in it. They believe in it. And uh, then they have their special undergarments they think God is concerned with. Uh, I don't know why God would care about your skivvies, you know. But um, secondly, let me say this about the, the ability of the garment. Not only does it change your appearance, but it covers any stain on you. It covers any stain on you. Whatever sin um, y y you've committed um, that would have kept you uh, out of heaven before that and it would have made it just confirmed your uncleanness that is now covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ through his shed blood and it covers it all so it, so it doesn't matter if your you know your clothes your appearance underneath were filthy and dirty and uh, looked horrible it's covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ and, and it's now I'm touching on these things lightly, and maybe, maybe we could uh, dwell upon each one of these points at much more uh, length, and I'm certain we could. But it covers one's appearance, and I'm so glad that my sins have been covered by faith in the blood of Christ and the righteousness of Jesus Christ Amen. now applied to me. And lastly, let me say this. I want you to consider the uh, absence of the garment. Verses 12, 13, and 14 in the text today. Uh, he saw a man not having a wedding garment. And uh, after the guests were all arrived, they'd all been seated. Uh, the king found a man who did not have on a wedding garment. And um, he thought he could just slip on through. He's going to get in the food line, start loading up his plate. And the king saw that, and he had nowhere to go and no table to hide under. And uh, he was speechless, the Bible says. And uh, the absence of the wedding garment produced three things before we finish today. It produced a showdown. The king confronted him about it and uh, asked why he didn't have on a wedding garment. The Bible said he was speechless. For the saved, it will take place at the judgment seat of Christ and um, the, the um, marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For the unsaved, he'll be caught off guard without a wedding garment at the white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20. 
It also produced a shock on the part of the person. He had no place to hide, nowhere to go, nothing to offer, no excuse to give. And um, the king, even to, no, even today, you go to some nice restaurants, and unless you have meet their minimum dress code, they won't even let you in. Now, now you have to have a, a face mask before they let you in, right? And that's the politician's fault, making life unbearable. How many heard of California's new requirement? Um, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. They said we had to flatten the curve. Remember back in the early days of this? We had to bring down the total number of cases, new cases, below a certain number. Well, now, Governor Newsom, by the way, when he was a uh, I think the mayor of San Francisco, or the mayor of Oakland, um, he performed the first gay wedding in California before it was made legal by the Supreme Court. And I heard some, polit some uh, radio announcers call him Any Twosome Newsome. Uh, that's his nickname now, Any Twosome Newsome. But now he says uh, California has to meet uh, racial equity minimum. That is, um, not only can the overall uh, percentage of COVID cases be down below a certain number, that that number also has to be below a certain level among certain ethnicities, Hispanic, black, maybe Koreans have their own category. So it's not enough that overall the total caseload is below a certain number. Now we can't op reopen anything until everybody's total numbers are down. Sometimes you want to say, well, maybe I wish we could somehow steer it and direct it only to the politicians. And then the citizens don't get any. Citizens are fine, healthy, but I guess we shouldn't talk that way. Now, someone may comment uh, under the video today that they agree with that. And if one of you want to comment on it, go right ahead. But lastly, the absence of the wedding garment will produce shame. It will produce shame. The man being cast out is a good picture of someone being cast into hell. Anyone who learns, uh, leaves this life without the perfect garment of Christ's righteousness covering their soul, the working of the Holy Spirit regenerating their dead spirit, um, that person's in for a rude awakening. You recall in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Luke 16. The rich man had everything. He fared sumptuously every day. It means he ate well, clothed in uh, purple. And um, Lazarus was a beggar, begging for crumbs that the rich man might give out, give away. And the dogs came and licked his the sores on his body, and no man gave unto him. In Bible times, as in present times, people seem to think the person who succeeds, he earns a lot of money, he has great fame, he gets accolades for whatever he's done with his career or her career, and they live in a nice home, they seem to have plenty of money to afford whatever it is they need, that that person must be right with God. Th those are all the outward indicators that that person's life is right with Jesus Christ or with God. And then Lazarus, poor, saying, what did that guy do wrong? Why did that guy end up homeless? Why did that guy 
do this and that. He must have made some bad mistakes. All of, all of those things, the, the poor man, might be true. They might not be true. But if that poor man, like Lazarus, knew Jesus Christ, and he had genuine faith in the provision of God to take care of him in those days, then, it's, then when he and the rich man died, the tables turned. The rich man found himself in a hell, uh, in torments, and Lazarus now being comfort, comforted by Abraham, in Abraham's bosom. And so what we think is the right way now may not be at all. And uh, if you have all, everything in the world, but you don't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ covering you, you're on your way to the devil's hell. You're on your way to a devil's hell. Let me ask you as we bring this to a close. If you died tonight, do you know for sure that you'd wake up with Jesus Christ in heaven? If there's a question mark over that, or if for some reason you're not sure, seek me out later. I'd love to talk to you and uh, help you to understand that if you're a sinner, God wants to forgive you. And help you to pray to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and trust Him and Him alone.